It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for today, Reverend Sally Perry. She is an international teacher, healer, and visionary. She worked in the Philippines, Brazil, Europe, and lived in India on and off for six years. Swami Sally has a 501c3 that helps take the children off the streets of India. Reverend Perry was an official observer at the 2000 World Millennium Peace Summit at the United Nations. Received the Hampton Roads of Virginia Outstanding Businesswoman of the Year Award and was a Unity Church teacher in Virginia Beach in the late 1970s. She created a center in Rockville, Virginia from 2002 to 2017, teaching Native American uh, teachings as well as for Eastern teachings, combining all she's learned from her mentors and experiences. Paul Solomon ordained her in 1992 for a minister of healing at our fellowship. Please welcome Reverend Sally Perry. I'm going to start by all the speakers in India, and you can do it with me. The first is Om. Three Shantis. Shanti. Shanti. I like to honor Paul Solomon for all his work. And today to welcome and honor the spirit of Sharon Solomon as she is hopefully going to sleep, I am told, in Japan. It was wonderful to hear her do the meditation. Since today, awareness is the art of meditation is what I'm going to speak about. It's taken from a book by you, Purush Paramananti, who initiated me as a Swami in 2008. I used the breath so you will hear breathing. I do not have a disease. I do not have Parkinson's. I've been tested. The energy runs very high in my body. And the more people I'm around, I shake more. That's why for years I've sat down to talk. Now I'm going to turn this upside down, which turned upside down for me two nights ago when I read something from Francis Foreman, which encompassed Edgar Casey being questioned. And here's what it said. Question 18, should the Christ consciousness be described as awareness? within each soul imprinted in a pattern on minds and waiting to be awakened by the will of the soul, each soul's oneness with God. I thought, I'm at the end of my notes, and Francis sends me this. And Casey's reply, I thought, this question encompasses the totality of all meditations. Okay, I was going to end with that, but I'm beginning with it. Should the Christ consciousness be described as awareness? Awareness, awareness, awareness. Without awareness, you cannot meditate. And I know that because I used to fall asleep all the time. 
in the beginning. My mind was like a thousand runaway horses. And believe me, I broke into no mind on the reservation in 1987. Took me 10 years to understand that. Painted Era, another one of his uh, help for meditation is drumming because the drum will take you down to Mother Earth and then you start climbing in consciousness. It's that ladder that you'll see in meditation that will let you know you are still moving up, up and inward. Now, Casey said very simply in 57.49.14, answer, correct. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> correct. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the beginning. That's why I made all these notes, because I live in no mind. And to get up in front of people and talk about topics, I'm liable to, on a day of balance, be way over here and then run over here from Germany to Alaska, to South America, to the Fellowship of It and Life. Thank you for bearing with me. Now, we have to exist as awareness to meditate. We have to exist as awareness to meditate. That will help us to transcend the mind. Awareness. 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 We also are going to transcend the body because the Far Eastern teachings is we're not our body, we're not our house, we're not our ego, we're not our intellect. Now, that was hard for me back in the 70s. What do you mean? <laughs> I got in a car accident, tore my knee. Tore my shoulder. I got a body for sure. Yeah. And meditation will take us to a higher point, rising up, as Michelle Obama says, rise up, rise up. And meditation will take us to be in the witness. And you've got to be aware to witness yourself. And what's going on is the beautiful meditation that you do here that Sharon did, that Paul started, that woke up your senses, woke up your senses. But to witness, you can't judge. The minute you judge, you connect to your self-judgment and to what you're judging. The minute you judge. And guess what? You disconnect from your God light inside because God doesn't judge. And that's a hard one. It took me years. I remember telling Painted Era one time, I've been working 10 years on judgment. I don't think I'll ever get past it. <laughs> And he lowered his glasses. He goes, me too. I said, oh, my God, here's my teacher. After Joyce and Paul, you know, they are lights in the world and have been lights in the world that bring the light into us. And you'll know it because when you get it, there'll be a light in your brain or somewhere in your body. And you'll know you're getting more light. And who knows, maybe one day you'll shake <laughs> and wish you weren't shaking so much. But it's the light, and that's it. So without judgment in your meditations and awareness, you'll have an experience of God. Because like the natives say, you're becoming more and more the hollow bone. The hollow bone. Yeah. That's what we dance for three, four days, no food or water. You pray a lot at first. 
but then you start transcending all the mind, all the emotion, and eventually you'll transcend the body. For me, I had 12 dances in nine years when the light hit me in the heart and sent me to India to live, to integrate the light, the cosmic light. There was no teacher or land in America, I was told, that could help me integrate the light I would receive. Now then the next thing is, oh my God, you know, we gotta achieve, we gotta do this. And I was like, I had to be in business and five businesses and I wanted to be number one. And I went to New York every year with all my people so they could see how great this world was. Yeah. But I thought I was the doer. It was much later in my healing work that I realized I didn't do anything but work with hollowing out, connecting to the light, and letting the light do the work. That non-doer is really hard. And the only way I got much easier with it was to connect, do my prayer, and say, God, you do it. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. So as we now meditate, we are developing our emotional body and our devotional body and our mental and spiritual body is all being developed with meditation because of our devotion. And Alex taught me a very simple, the psychic surgeon, Sally, we have two bodies. We have a spiritual body and a physical body. You have fed the physical with your teachings and your work, but now you must feed your spiritual body and be aware of your physical healing spirit. So you must feed it. It's the same thing with relationships. You've got to feed the relationship spiritually and physically. And when Swami first came here, I knew in India they kind of looked down on Americans because we divorced. But I had a different feeling about divorce. I thought and was shown that when two people come together to work out something, if one works it out like 70%, the other one still got 30%, there's no way they're either going to grow. So one has to make the break and continue the growth. Whether it's the one stuck in 30% or the one stuck in 70%. And I believe that divorce is okay because it's time to do a new path. And it takes strength and bravery and sometimes sacrifice to be able to go through a divorce. Meditation is the journey in consciousness. It's surrendering all to God to become choiceless. We had so much fun in India with choicelessness that the saints could take one piece of candy, but they couldn't tell us they wanted two or three. But I could hear or feel they wanted more. Yeah. So I had fun with that. So when Swami came to America, uh, I was sitting, and normally you don't sit at a table with a sadhu uh, or a guru, I should say. Um, but I was allowed. And usually in India, when they eat, you give them a big plate because they'll give half of it back to the family. 
that's feeding them for blessing. So they didn't have corn in Indians. Oh, he really loved corn. So when he got one piece, no solid tea, no, no corn. So then I gave him two pieces of tea, no corn. I said, you're working on choicelessness? The journey, ultimately, will clear your mind. When I first come here in the 70s, people were coming to me, uh, should I go take this meditation and learn to bend forks? And to me, it felt like a waste of energy, but if you need to do it, fine. Because later, I needed to firewalk once. And most people would think, yeah, no, that's crazy. Well, actually, it was a group of Paul Solomon, Jerry Templitz, and all of them knew me. And I was a businesswoman, so they're going, you're going to burn your feet, you're going to burn your feet. <laughs> so I kept praying, and I decided I would join hands and not walk. But as it ended, Spirit said, let go of the hand and walk. And I walked, and I did get burned. Afterwards, in sharing the people from Japan that were here, the one girl started crying. She said, I didn't walk because the turtles in the river here, they couldn't breathe. So I gave my energy to the turtles. So I started crying and said, next time I'm going to give my energy to the turtles. I need to do it once without judgment. And again, uh, when you're trying to go in meditation and it's hard, I did my forgiveness work first. I did it, I learned the basic in becoming a unity teacher, but I took it out into the world, into my other work with Paul and with um, uh, Alex Orvito and with Joseph Ryan and finally into India. Each step was beneficial, all of it. Even if you need to burn, bend a fork, I guess. And of course, I could see with his meditation about taking the candlelight inside. They weren't teaching that at first, just to watch the light. And once you separate, it's not inside. That's where judgment comes in. You separate yourself from God when you judge yourself or others. God is always connected. God is always connected. We are the connectors to, to what's inside of us. Now, when I first did a meditation for a group of men here, I was led to do a guided imagery, and I didn't even know what it was. There were like 32 men. And I just led them through. And then when it was time for him to come back, I said, take a deep breath and come back. And nobody came back. <laughs> so I got all these businessmen with their heads down. <laughs> And I said to Spirit telepathically, this is not funny. <laughs> Tell them again. Take a deep <laughs> Finally, the third time, take a very deep breath and come back from the river. <laughs> and they came back. Well, the economist had invited me to, he was, they were speaking at the ARE to a private little party. And when I got there, he introduced me as the only 
woman that would be brave enough to go to the optimist club <laughs> and talk on uh, meditation and take them so far out they couldn't get back. Yeah. And there was a woman from Miami that was a specialist in that modality. And she got me to the corner and she said, you enticed all the senses. So when you do that in the future, come back and let go of seeing the red flowers and rolling water and all that to bring them back. So part of learning, a big part is being aware. Joseph used to say, we eat with our eyes. We hear with our ears. We see also and sense and smell with our nose, our skin also as we develop. And between each word, the space is God. The sense is dissolved. The judgment dissolves. The body dissolves. This is called the embodied soul. The soul that's in us that we wake up to is the supreme soul. It's formless. It's in this, that, you, me, paper. The formless consciousness is the ultimate mountaintop. And Sharon, when I spoke to her, told me, I said, explain to me, because I believe Paul's uh, guided imagery was very wonderful. And she said, well, the mountaintop prepares you for what you believe, Sally. And when I first started in the work, especially with Alex, everybody wanted to have an OBE, out-of-body experience, and most of them needed to have an IBE, in-body experience. So that's where awareness comes in. And when Swami Permanent in India does a meditation, even in talking, he'll stop and say, awareness, awareness. Okay. It's the gift God gave us so we can exist in meditation with God. I thank the fellowship. I thank everyone here. I thank any of my students out there uh, in TV or radio land or whatever this Zoom land is. Uh, yeah. And I want to uh, thank Karen and Jack for taking the, their time to pick me up because I don't drive anymore. I have a driver's license uh, till 83. Until I'll be 83. I'm 82 now. March the 7th. I'm a Pisces too, but wait. <laughs> yeah. So. Again, Bruce, thank you for all you've done and for that wonderful man back there and the one here too. I don't know what you're doing, but uh, you're making it all happen. And it warmed my heart to see Dax get up and go drum a little. Yeah. So chanting, drumming, Write your forgiveness. You can go on sallyberry.net. I've updated my forgiveness work. And it starts in the Far East with the breath, to follow your breath. You can't be in your mind. 
if you're watching your breathing. The breath is the Holy Spirit. And we all are Holy Spirits in God's eyes. Because he's all seeing. Yeah. I'm so grateful to have come back to Virginia Beach for a few years. And it's wonderful to see some of you all and it's even more wonderful to know that Sharon is in Japan. <laughs> Alex used to always tell me if I learned Japanese, he'd take me there because I had some, God gave some miracles with my work there, the Japanese people. And again, oh, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Namaste. Namaste.